I spent a lot of time talking with singers, and one of the frequent topics of conversation is vocal training and, and coaching. And there seem to be about as many theories of singing as there are singers. I wonder what kind of vocal training that you had, and uh, do you have any pet theories regarding vocal pedagogy? Mm. Well, I have to preface any discussion we have about vocal pedagogy by I'm just going to pose a question to you, or throw out something for consideration. The people by whom we judge how well we're doing today, those singers of two or three generations ago, the generation of Caruso, which included hundreds of great singers, Tetrazzini and Rufo and, and uh, Antonio Scotti, Jean Doresque and all those. Why is it that those people became, how is it that those people became great singers without the benefits of modern vocal pedagogy? And why is it that with all of these so-called advances in modern vocal pedagogy, we have so few great singers today. I think that what we have done is missed the forest for the trees. Mm. I think, number one, learning the art of singing has been taken out of its natural environment, which is the theater, which is the opera house, the concert hall. It is essentially an oral and aural tradition and we have put it into the hands of well-meaning academics who generally have no frame of reference. And as a result, we are training people to look for the component parts of the vocal mechanism without understanding that no technique, no understanding of basically what is technique. It's an understanding of the human physiology which allows one to sing with a lack of detrimental tension, all right? Almost no voice teachers that I've ever spoken to today when I do master classes have a clue as to what is the basic human physiology and how it functions as it relates to singing. We talk in imagery, we try to come up with gimmicks. We run all kinds of scientific tests and all that kind of thing, and none of those things have produced better singers. The other thing that I think that vocal pedagogues have done to their detriment and to the detriment of the art of singing is that most young singers today are not only not encouraged to listen to the great singers who have preceded them, by, by, by means of that vast recorded legacy that we have, but they are actively discouraged. Mm. And if you get together a group of singers under the age of 25, under the age of 30 for that matter, and start talking about people like Jean Doresque or Tetrazzini, or scarily enough, even if you start to talk about Birgit Nilsson, I believe that one does not learn how to sing solely from a voice teacher. Now, Everything I've said up to now seems to indicate that I think voice teachers are useless and worthless. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the balance that has to exist between a person acting as your guide, as your partner, as well as your own taking of responsibility as someone who wants to be a singer has gotten all bent out of shape. And what happens is that singers aspiring singers no longer in general take the responsibility to develop a frame of reference style cannot be learned by having someone say now sing that this way style is something that you develop by listening to people do it and how anybody can pretend that they're trying to be a great opera singer who has never listened to Caruso, to Tetrazzini, to Claudia Muzio, to the list goes on and on and on, it just devo defies logic for me. If you were a Broadway singer and you were going to do South Pacific for the first time, you would certainly listen to the original cast recording. Why do opera singers, classical singers today, why are they so arrogant that they feel that they, removed by several hundred years from the source, can approach it in a vacuum, can read it in a book, and do it. It's ludicrous. You know, Caruso and those folks knew Mascagni. They knew Verdi. They knew Puccini personally. Some of the German singers knew Wagner. And 
even if they didn't know Rossini and Donizetti and the people who preceded Wagner and the French composers, they worked with people who did know them. And you are close to the source. It seems to me that modern vocal pedagogy has become so interested in finding the gimmick and so interested in exerting control over the individual student that it has forgotten what it's there to do. And it's no wonder because as soon as music was taken out of the hands of working musicians and put into the hands of people, well-meaning people, but put into the hands of an academic environment which seeks to present the music of the past as sacred entities which they were never intended to be. We, we've distorted what music is about. Music is about the expression of the human condition and music is about how composers responded to their surroundings. We don't view music that way. We view Mozart's works as pristine things which were which were handed down to us from on high and we mustn't ever infuse them with any sort of understanding of the humanity of the music. A friend of mine once said it's as if sometimes one thinks that there was no sexual intercourse that happened until you know well into the 19th century. Now I maybe I'm overstating my case because I don't want to imply for a moment that all of the scholarship and all of the preparation that is necessary to do this is something that one can discard. I'm not saying that at all because that has to be there. But what we've done is that we have forgotten largely in institutions of higher learning that all of that information should be there to free us to express ourselves. It should free us to understand the parameters of the music and therefore to make the right choices stylistically for the music. But it ha it's not about that anymore. It's about doing it right and wrong in a very narrow scope. And it's, nobody seems to want to put it all in its proper context. We are taught to be critical, but we are not taught to be discerning. And there's an enormous difference between just finding fault with everything, which is what happens, and trying to be discerning and trying to understand why that performance was that way or why did this person make that choice. Now, singers, I think, are the biggest sinners when it comes to this stuff. I don't know a single conductor, young conductor, who doesn't listen to the great conductors on recording and compare performances and try to understand what, you know, why was Furtwängler's Beethoven effective in this way and why was Fritz Reiner's effective this way. Singers don't do that. I teach enough master classes where I go out and I don't know what singing students do with their free time, but it's certainly not engaged in listening and developing a frame of reference as to where they've come from. And frankly, if we don't have that, how are we supposed to do justice to these works we're trying to recreate? I think that's one of the reasons why today on the opera stage we have generic performances. All the notes are in the right place, but nobody cares. The audiences don't care. The audiences leave the opera house cold in many cases. And because the singers don't have a frame of reference, they accept roles that they shouldn't because they're inappropriate for them. Because the people running opera houses also don't have the frame of reference anymore. They're making casting choices based upon the looks of the person and not upon whether that person really is the right voice or the right temperament or anything to do these things. Mm -hmm. And there are many of us in the business who really fear for the future of opera worldwide because we are losing touch with where opera came from. And to me, if you've lost touch with the best traditions from which any kind of musical or theatrical expression springs, you can't possibly then put your own generational stamp on it because you're entering it as if in a vacuum and you're trying to reinvent the wheel. And it seems to me that that's what we've done. I've been very fortunate in my life in that I've had voice teachers who were willing to be expendable. Voice teachers who took me by the hand and opened my eyes and helped me to understand the physiological requirements of singing, but always said, you have to take responsibility for what you do. It means, you ask my wife, it means that I spend an inordinate amount of time listening to my predecessors. I spend an inordinate amount of time trying to understand why some things work and why some don't. I, I don't mean to state here that I think I do everything right because I know I don't. 
But when I make a mistake, I know that I've made a mistake having come to it with as much knowledge as possible. And if I make a mistake, I don't have anybody else to blame but myself. I still have people that I go to, you know, to coaches and to and to my voice teacher in New York, but the individual performer is the one that has to take the responsibility, has to have a point of view artistically, has to have an understanding of how he fits into what has preceded him before you can make any kind of a, of a statement, you know? And because it's a lifelong process, it's a learning that never stops, you see? And I think one of the things that pedagogy today tends to do is it tends to be goal-oriented. It tends to be, you learned this technique, and then you have achieved your goal. But it, it, it just doesn't work that way. And the more you do it, the more you gain insights as to what you're doing. The more often that you do it, the more desperately you need to find people who are on the same wavelength as you, who can give you honest feedback as to what your work is about. Because I get to make recordings, I find that that is a great tool for me. Because in the recording studio, you know you can hear if you view the recording as part of the process, if you view the recording process as part of the process of continuing to learn about how it all works, mm -hmm. when you listen to the playbacks, what I tend to do is to, to not worry about, am I louder than the other singers? What I tend to, to listen for is, did I sing that as beautifully as I could? Why did that work and that didn't? Mm -hmm. And then you go back and do the second take and you try very subtle kinds of changes. Now, I'm not sure that I could even teach somebody the things that I'm talking about because they are the result of having done this for nearly 20 years and the result of having trained my ear and trained my psyche over years and years and years and years of listening to everybody that I could put my hands on and frankly I don't know any other substitute people that play jazz for instance tell you that they learn to play jazz from listening to other people people that are in orchestras have to learn to listen to be a part of that thing. Singers are the only musicians in the world, particularly opera singers, who don't listen, who are not trained to listen. They are self-centered, and I know that what I say here is, is going to offend a lot of teachers, but I'm not indicting the teachers. I don't know a single voice teacher that sets out to do harm to his or her students. That's not it. I mean, I, I think that, that those people are among the most earnest and desirous of doing right of any group of people that you can think of. But because of the situation in which they find themselves, they have to, I think they have to encourage their students not to, not to put so much responsibility on them as teachers. And they have to say to the student from time to time, I don't know, you're going to have to figure that out for yourself. Mm. Go listen to, you know, to 45 great sopranos you know, lock yourself in your room because ultimately we teach ourselves how to sing. No matter how good your teacher is, there's just an anecdote that I could use to end this long-winded discourse here. A friend of mine told me about uh, a man that he used to know in New York who had heard Caruso when, when this gentleman was a very, very young man. He went to hear Caruso sing at the Met in about 1916, 1915. And he talks as a 15-year-old kid sitting up in the rafters there and being spellbound by the great Caruso. And he said, I watched everything that Caruso did and I understood clearly, I understood perfectly to the depths of my soul how to sing. Because I watched him and I said, yes, that's it. And he said, I went home and I stood in front of the mirror and I did exactly what Caruso had done and I sounded terrible. <laughs> <laughs> if you're looking for guarantees, there aren't any. And at best, a good voice teacher no matter how well possessed he is of the knowledge of singing, he is only good, as good as the receptacle to which he's giving that information. And I think that there could be a lot greater singers in the world than there are today if vocal students would understand that they don't need anybody's permission to sing. They have to take the responsibility to do it. Because if that's what they really want to do, they will find a path, they will find a way. I think that's really what it's all about.